Our first presenter will be uh, Matt Hernan from the Ballarat Gold Project and um, we'll see Tommy Burrows soon so when Tom arrives we'll, we'll put his memory stick in and give him a second gig but Matt may as well get us started at this time. Matt, some more people. Right, yeah. So today I'm just going to give you a quick update on um, uh, the Ballarat Gold Project, uh, where we're up to, and what we've been doing over the last few months. So the usual disclaimer and disclosure. If you read quick. Um, Oh, Tom? Yep, beautiful. Um, yeah, there's the usual thing for those that are interested. So, <coughs> your take home message is that mining's begun. Uh, we're aiming for gold production in September with our first gold uh, bar due to be poured by the end of the month. So, we'll be transitioning from an explorer to a producer this year. So, there's a bit of a summary of the business plan and what we've achieved and where we're going. Oops. Um, <coughs> so in May 2010, Castle Main bought the Ballarat Gold Project, completed 15,000 metres of drilling uh, to find sufficient resources to justify recommencement, completed a feasibility study by March, awarded a contract, or the mining contract, to Fibar. Um, they're targeting, or we are targeting 50,000 ounces of gold per annum and an average grade of well, around 8, between 7.5 and 8.5. And at a cash cost between $710 and $750 an ounce. Um, and as I said before, by the end of September, we hope to have produced our first gold bar and we'll be into production. So why, are we going to, uh, why do we think we'll succeed? We're fully funded, we've got no debt, no hedging, and robust margins, Opera, uh, aiming for an operating cost of $730 an ounce. Our first production uh, in the third quarter of 2011 and we'll be targeting 50,000 ounces per annum. We've had 15 months, and we've got 28,000 metres of underground drilling data uh, to draw from. And we've got extensive geological knowledge of other Victorian gold fields with uh, personnel within uh, Castle Main having worked at most of the Victorian gold fields now. Um, we have respect for the structural controls on mineralisation, so our resource estimation isn't just based on uh, where the good assays are and sticking a box around it. We've got a realistic extraction rate, and ounces per annum match the mineralisation styles. As the company line says, we'll be letting the geology do the talking. So uh, the Ballarat mine restart is de-risked. The portals and declines are in, processing plans built and commissioned and fully permitted to operate. And we've got an extensive portfolio of other prospective projects um, located within the region. And we've got a, we think we've got a balanced mix of near-term production, development and exploration. No, whoops, that wasn't meant to happen, sorry. So back to this slide, you can see the uh, existing working, oh, historic workings in the top part of the page there. The sub-vertical pink lines to mark cross-course faults, which break the whole field up into compartments from north to south. Uh, so we're currently uh, declining down in the Warhawk and low in the Lamberis declines, the far red circle, and we're doing all mining in the sovereign decline uh, in a remnant area that was left by Lahir. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, where we're going uh, <coughs> down in the Warhawk and the Lamberis. So in the Lamberis decline, which is the one on the left, we're aiming for model mineralisation. That's our first mining objective, which we announced last year, I think. Uh, <coughs> the Britannia, oh, the, sorry, the Warhawk decline, heading to the north. Where's the laser? Oh yes, there we go. So this area down here is, uh, is the Warhawk decline projecting into the Britannia zone, chasing up uh, its dual purpose access and uh, platform for delineation into our circuit mining objective in the Britannia zone. Um, in addition to that, we're following up some poten a potential third oil source on the Solomon anticline. So historically most of the reductions come from the first chance anticline with a little bit from the Solomon. Um, 
Our first two mining objectives are on the first chance anticline, but that there is uh, potential on that uh, Solomon line, and that's what we're following up and drilling at the moment. <coughs> but I'll be talking mostly about uh, our mining in the Sovereign Mako Fault Zone. So this is what we had uh, when Castlemaine took over. There was a, a nice big um, reef shape that Lahir had left for us. And that blue shape, uh, the green is the development that Lahir had pushed through the centre of the uh, ore body and stopped. This purple shape up here is the Australian Arms Anticon, uh, sorry, Cross Course Fault. So that uh, is the northern extent of this particular compartment. Um, there wasn't a hell of a lot of drilling to the north to determine whether mineralisation extended through to there. Um, something, uh, so, something we noticed sort of straight up was um, the orientation and style of mineralisation was different from the north end of the shape through to the south end. Um, so to validate, I suppose, as part of our due diligence, we um, reassessed the uh, geological interpretations through that area and came up with the hypothesis that it's probably not just one big flat fault, but a number of curvy planar faults running through, the, through that area that control the mineralisation with a whole lot of spurring. This zone down here where the faults coalesce um, there's moderate to good grades and uh, substantial um, quartz volumes, I suppose, due to the convergence of the faults. The other thing we noticed was that there's some really nice grades associated. It's a bit hard to see, the scan doesn't come out real well, but there's a shale bed wrapping around the syncline through here uh, that seems to have high grades associated with it. And when we assessed uh, the grades that were within that shale zone, they were statistically a lot higher uh, in grade than the rest of the uh, samples within the, within the reef. So <coughs> in addition to that we also decided to push east and west, mining out through the shape to give ourselves a bit of a picture of what the geology looked like. So we mined both ways, the detailed mapping of the geology. Uh, you can see the main Mako fault is interpreted to be this quartz vein coming up through here. It actually it's a, it is a west dipping fault, but it actually flattens out, dips east for a little bit, and then wraps under the keel of the syncline, and then zooms back up bedding. This zone in here is the shale zone that I spoke about before, where there seem to be uh, statistically in, uh, high grades. We also saw bits of gold associated with the um, upper fault, I suppose, out on this zone. And you can see little faults running out through here, and probably peeling out across the top, as the interp showed. So we saw little bits of gold in there, so that's what those little pink circles are for. There's little bits of gold there, I don't know if you can see them, but the pencil lead's about half a mil thick. So, you yeah, know, it's fairly nuggety, I suppose. Yeah, relative, relatively speaking. So having identified this area here as a um, statistically higher grade zone, we thought that would be a good place uh, to mine north and south. So we've pushed this drive pushed it north for a little bit until the mineralisation sort of petered out or it actually plunged into the fall. So the orientation of the fall or the plunge of the fall changed significantly and, and shot through into the floor and we weren't able to keep up with it. Heading south though, it was fairly consistent and we pushed it through. You can see the fault, we're looking south here, the fault running through there with nice tension veins coming off the top. Same in this face through here through the middle. So it hasn't changed in its orientation or its um, style very much. You can see there's a little bit of gold there. We also saw some gold down in some of these stringers. And then as we progressed further to the uh, south, we noticed that this fault lost its, uh, some of its displacement, <coughs> and therefore wasn't as strongly mineralised. Now that photo is a bit hard to see. There's actually a cross course, a minor cross course fault with about two inches of displacement there that has got some uh, carbonate and dirty sort of staining on the face, which makes it difficult to see the structure. But Instead of having a nice sharp fault through there, it's turned into a more of a tension vein array um, or a shear. <coughs> In addition to that, we thought, well, we had a drill hole running out to the north of there. It had some good grades in it. We didn't have much, else, much other information, so we decided to just drive north, follow the structure, sample intensively and see what we saw. A little bit of visible gold there. Uh, what we saw was um, significant uh, volumes of quartz associated with the uh, a number of faults coalescing. So I think there's a fault sitting just out of the top of there. There's another one right down here and one through the middle. And uh, as they converge, there seems to be a, a brick-shaded sort of quartz zone associated with that. 
Since we'd also seen nice visible goal out on the uh, western edge of the reef in this position, we thought we might as well run along the edge of the reef. We did have to cop a little bit of dilution uh, to maintain a safe pillar width between these two drives, but we sell reasonable grades and significant volumes of quartz again with fault here, fault here and another fault below sort of coalescing, forming that nice big blowout of quartz. And they seem to be running down the western limb of the anticline, so there's the first chance the anticline runs through about there. And so that, that fault has sort of hit the western limb of that and wrapped down bedding. And the other faults seem to do the same thing. So <coughs> from when we started to where we are now, our, uh, our geological understanding of the reef has evolved. Uh, instead of having the one single fault running through the, through the reef, we now think there's probably <coughs> three at least, probably more faults. There's three models at the moment that we're continuing to review the geology as we, as we mine through there. Um, interestingly, it, it wraps right over. It goes almost east dipping for a little bit. Um, probably due to a nice sandstone core up there that it doesn't want to try and cut through. Um, the other interesting thing that, as we uh, noticed when we first looked at the, the reef shape, the difference in style is probably due to the fact that the mineralisation initially uh, occurs on the basal fault, peters out down in this zone, and the fault above seems to take up the displacement and associated mineralisation with that. So recognising that means that you know, there's a section in here that uh, you know, probably isn't as well mineralised as we thought, but uh, there's upside, I suppose, on this thing now that we understand that that's taken up the, uh, the mineralisation. And there's potentially upside further to the south if these little stringers that are in interpreted to run up there are actually mineralisation associated with that top fault. So that's an ongoing um, interpretive thing and, uh, and we'll, uh, through mining, we'll probably understand that better. <coughs> so... Reviewing, I suppose, the geological model. Uh, this is a, a bit of an early picture of um, what, what was believed to be the, the fault model in Ballarat. So you can see the, the faults running up, uh, the western limbs of beds breaking out across the eastern limb, and then eventually they'd find a western limb again and shoot back up that. And the mineralisation seems to be where it breaks across, across the country. Um, we see that in Ballarat East in these two pictures. But also the Wattle Gully mine has the same picture, so it's not uh, a theme that only is only relevant to Ballarat, I suppose. It's relevant to other fields within Victoria. So here's a more recent, uh, a number of pictures of more recent um, models, which have that, you know, discordant uh, to bedding faults. So these big flat faults just smashing their way through country rock. Um, that's been a pretty popular theory, but I think. Uh, it's probably pretty unlikely. I think faults are, or we think now that faults are more likely to follow a, a, you know, a path of least resistance, follow a, a western limb, break across east limbs where they can't follow something easily and then back up the western limb. Um, and that's something that we've um, proven through mining. So initially we had this, these big flat faults modelled uh, through the Solomon and first chan chance anticline. Through drilling out of the Solomon through the Western Limb, we found that we didn't actually see uh, the big flat faults through there. Instead, we saw um, little laminated veins running up bedding, um, supporting the theory that you know the faults take a path of least resistance. They shoot up a bed where it's where it's uh, convenient, across country where they have to, and then back up beds again. And that's um, and those those old cues that we see are goal bearing. So you know there'll be a couple of grams in a lot of those. So that's about all I've got to say. Um, thanks for listening. If you've got any questions, fire away. Anyone got questions for Matt? I'll ask one there, Matt. Is, uh, is Ron scheduled in for the quarter production? Yeah, we're on schedule at this stage, yeah, yeah. Um, we're definitely on target for that, yep. So we've, at the moment, so we've been, yeah, we've, we've been mining ore since uh, June, and that ore's built a significant stockpile on the surface. We've started processing, uh, and yeah, we're, we're on track to uh, pour our first gold bar by the end of the month. Yeah, I've got a quick one, Nathan Phillips, uh, Possum Gold Mine. Um, just how recent is that idea that 
uh, <coughs> propagate up west looms, crack across, and then back up west? Uh, it's not that recent. It's, an, uh, it's probably an old theory, though. As we showed in the, I think the third last slide, there was an, the original model was that it ran up, uh, ran up beds across country and then up beds again. Um, from my experience at Bendigo, that was something we saw as well, and, and that was a model we used. But uh, recent uh, models in, in Ballarat during the Lahiri era and perhaps a little bit earlier had these great big flat faults that just smashed their way through. Uh, I think the, the key thing for us is to, to move away from that, I suppose, and, and uh, more towards that geological... Um, yeah, that more apt geological model, I suppose. I should partly answer that question. I, I made Matthew put those last three slides in there because <laughs> um, I, I got in a horrible tangle when I first got to Ballarat trying to correlate faults that were known and named and there was a very standard uh, stratigraphy. You know, this fault was above, this fault was above this. <laughs> and uh, as we drilled holes out under the Sulman line, we were sort of putting names on them. We were drilling further holes and discovering there were stacked sets of faults in those eastern limbs. And it... It didn't correlate where the laminated quartz veins and other features on the western limbs were. So, from an exploration point of view, it had a very big implication. And I deliberately called what previously had been described as single faults and associated with a load uh, fault zones because I was seeing corridors of stacked faults in these eastern limbs. And they do, in my belief, partition themselves into numerous planes, bedding probably and cleavage as well on those western limbs. Uh, and recently, I guess the last slide there showed those big um, red traces, they were quite deep holes that um, most of their life went through the, the western limb. And they discovered all those laminated quartz veins at the position whereby the Mako fold zone should have been loading stress into that limb. Um, so from an exploration point of view, uh, it, it's, it's not just uh, a discordant bed that you can predict where you should be drilling on that limb. So that, that, that I think is worth getting out there. I'd love to write a paper, but this is a, a faster way to um, get that information out. I just thought it was quite interesting because uh, possible we don't have the uh, quartz uh, massive reefs to worry about. So we see a lot of these structures and, and it's very similar to that. Uh, and that's the geometries that we're putting forward as well. So it was just very interesting to hear. Yeah. Oh, look, um, <coughs> it's not you. Uh, go back to Clive Williams' document of 1996. Uh, Waddle Gully, you know, there's people who have published things there. All those faults coalesce head down the western <coughs> end. So uh, it's... it's it's just the, the application, and maybe I was a little bit surprised that uh, that was the model I saw or inherited, and I couldn't make those names fit.